Hello everybody and welcome to the next audiobook. <laughs> this is an audiobook for Coming Home, which is the third and final story in Step Closer, which came out like a week ago now, which is insane. Um, yeah, I'm very excited for this one. I've heard this one is strange, but uh, I've heard it's also good and I, I, I'm really excited to read it. Um, let me just move my mic quickly, hopefully it doesn't make a massive sound, but apologies if it does. <laughs> there we go. That's better. Now, now I can actually, now I can actually talk properly. Anyway, um, yeah, this is the final one. I haven't read it yet, um, so you're going to get my full reaction to it. Um, I think it's going to be quite long, but I hope not. Anyway, uh, let's begin. Susie listened to gravel cackling, crackling under the tyres of her family's old minivan, 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 as her mum manoeuvred it past Oliver, the big oak tree in front of their house. Susie was the one who named it Oliver. Her sister, Samantha, thought naming a tree was stupid. Her parents said it wasn't usually done, but that, but that didn't mean she couldn't do it, so she did. Oliver was really, really big. Susie's dad said Oliver was older than their house and that was really old. Susie's mum, great 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 grandma, had been born in this house over 150 years ago, and Oliver was already there. As soon as we get the groceries put away, Susie's mum said, I'll start dinner. She spoke slowly, with weird spaces between some of her words. Susie thought it sounded like someone was trying to stop her mum from talking, and her mum was working really hard to talk anyway. Susie thought of voices as colours. Her mum's used to be bright orange, now it was dull brown. It had been this new colour for a long time. Susie missed the old colour. Does sp spaghetti sound okay? Susie's mum asked in the same disturbing voice. Susie didn't respond to the question because she didn't care about dinner and she knew Samantha would care. Samantha cared about everything. She liked to be the boss. I think we should have those curlicue noodles instead, Samantha said. Susie smirked. See? Samantha's voice has changed colours too. It had never been bright. Her voice used to be kind of a pale blue, but now it was a grey. Susie turned and pressed her nose against the minivan's side window so she could see Oliver more clearly. She frowned. Oliver looked sad, even more than he usually did at this time of year, scattered in a ragged, ragged wreath around the base of his thick, knobby trunk. Um, pale yellow and dull red leaves fit flittered over his exposed roots in the afternoon breeze. More than half of Oliver's branches were bare, including the thick branch that suspended Susie's tire swing. The rest of the branches held leaves the same colour as those lying on the ground. Oliver always lost all of his leaves in the, in the fall. Three years before, when Susie was four and Samantha was three, Susie got very upset about the leaves falling from the oak tree. She told her mum the tree was crying, and if the tree was crying, it was feeling bad, and if it was feeling, it needed a name. That's when she named him Oliver. Samantha, though a year younger, said naming a tree was frivolous. Frivolous was a word she learned from Jeannie, their godmother. Samantha liked learning words. She liked learning, period. She didn't like frivolous things the way Susie did. Susie's mum explained that Oliver wasn't crying when he lost his leaves. He was preparing himself for the winter. He had to let go of the leaves so he could keep his trunk fed through the cold months. Then after the cold months, he'd grow new leaves. He has to let go before he can regrow, she said. We all have to do that sometimes. Ooh, foreshadowing. <laughs> Susie sort of understood this, but she still thought Oliver was sad. The only thing that made her feel okay about the falling leaves was their beautiful colours. Normally, Oliver's falling leaves were golden yellow and bright red. As Susie's mum pulled the minivan around the side of the house, Susie turned to look back at Oliver. His leaves looked different this year, duller and drier. Susie wondered if it had something to do with the elves that lived in his trunk. She grinned. She knew Oliver didn't have elves in his trunk. She was just being silly. But she once told Samantha he did, just to bug her. As soon as the minivan stopped at the stairs to the left of the wraparound porch, Samantha unbuckled her seatbelt and threw open her door. Samantha was always in a hurry. Susie's mum didn't move, even after she turned off the engine. She did this a lot, Susie had noticed. 
Her mum would kind of get stuck, like she was in, like she was a wind-up toy that doesn't get wound up enough. She'd just stop in the middle of doing something and stare off into the distance. It scared Susie because she wasn't sure if her mum was still. She, she wasn't sure if her mum was still there. It looked like she was, but it felt like she'd left her body behind, a sort of bookmark to hold her place while her thoughts took the rest of her some place else. The car engine ticked a few times before going silent. Susie smelled the onions in one of the shopping bags in the back of the minivan. She smelled something else too. No, not smelled. It wasn't her nose that told her something was in the air. It was... what? Her other senses? What other senses? Jeannie, t Jeannie once told Susie that she was special. That Susie had an ability most others didn't have. She was plugged in, Jeannie said. Susie had no idea what that meant, but she liked the sound of it. Jeannie said it was the reason why Susie felt things other people didn't feel. Right now, Susie felt like something was wrong. That something was like a smell, like the smell of something uh, rotting. <laughs> Going stale? Susie wasn't sure. Susie wanted to say something to get her mum moving again, but then she noticed Samantha was standing next to the minivan, looking through Susie's window. Samantha had that look on her face, the look she wore often lately. Susie didn't understand the look. It was part angry, part sad, and part scared. Susie's mum finally moved. Sighing, she shook her head and pulled the keys from the ignition. She picked up her purse and opened her door. We need to get those groceries inside. It could rain. Susie glanced through the windshield toward the low-hanging grey clouds beyond the steep green roof of the old house. The clouds were heavy and dark. More, for more, more foreshadowing. The big house had a lot of space, so Susie and Samantha each had their own room. Susie, though, liked hanging out in Samantha's room. She thought Samantha would rather she didn't, but even though Samantha liked to boss people around, she wasn't mean. She and Susie both liked people to be happy. So that because Susie liked playing in Samantha's room, Samantha let her. Samantha wasn't as good as sharing other things, though, like toys. She insisted she and Susie play with their own toys. Susie always wished she and Samantha could do things together, not just side by side. When Susie got her cool baking set for Christmas a couple of years back, the one with all the fun plastic foods and the pots and pans and the hot pink apron, she wanted to play restaurant with Samantha. But Samantha wouldn't do it. She insisted on playing instead with her own construction kit. Even if they were both playing with dolls, Samantha wanted to keep her dolls apart, like right now. Susie sat on the thick blue rag, uh, rag, <laughs> the blue rug that lay on the floor next to Samantha's big bed. The rug matched the crisp curtains on the window that looked out at Oliver. Susie glanced at him. He looked like he'd dropped a few more leaves. His remaining ones hung, hung limply in the muted grey evening light. Why does this remind me of Frozen <laughs> with, the, with the two sisters? In front of her, Susie's dolls were arranged on blocks set up in a semicircle. It was a choir, and she was going to direct them. But first, she had to be sure they were all in the right spots. She moved the dolls around, deciding who would sing part of the song, humming while she did it. She didn't normally hum, her mother did, but she hadn't heard her mother hum in a long time. On the opposite side of the rug, Samantha had her own dolls perched in the front of the boxes. The boxes were working stations, Samantha said. Susie wasn't sure if the dolls were in school or at a job. Either way, it was pretty clear Samantha's dolls weren't going to have as much fun as Susie's. Did Samantha see that too? Maybe that was why she kept looking over at Susie's dolls and blocks. Susie crossed her legs and looked around. Samantha's room was so organised, with light blue canvas bins stacked up neatly on white shelves, a big white desk with super bright metal desk lamp, the big bed with its simple metal frame, and its perfectly made blue and white checked uh, bedspread with two tidy white nightstands with their small blue lamps and the window seat covered with its simple thin blue cushion. Susie's room, which she could just see through a connecting door, was filled with colour and chaos. She had a window seat too, thick and tufted and covered in purple velour. Uh, what? <laughs> it was piled with flowery pillows. Her purple shelves had no bins. Susie hated bins. She liked to see her toys and books and plush animals because they made her feel happy. They all hung out in the open on the shelves, like they were having a big party. 
Samantha looked over at Susie's dolls again. She pressed her lips together so tightly it made the skin around her mouth pucker. The expression made her look like an angry Pekinese, Pekinese dog. <laughs> One of those dogs used to live next door, and the first time Susie saw it, she laughed because it reminded her of Samantha. <laughs> oh, shots. Susie wondered if she ever looked like a dog. She didn't think so. Even though she and Samantha had similar hair and basically the same eyes, they didn't look the same on the two girls. Susie's light brown hair flowed around her face. Samantha's was caught in a tight ponytail. Susie looked wild and, mysteri and mischievous, and Samantha looked like a good girl. Susie's brown eyes were usually wide open while Samantha's were often squinting, so Susie looked eager and Samantha had looked cautious. Susie had a smaller nose and mouth, and was usually called cute. Samantha had their dad's larger nose and mouth, and Susie once heard her grandma say about Samantha, she'll grow into her looks and turn into a handsome woman. Samantha glanced again at Susie's dolls before rearranging their, her own dolls to stand at their stations. Poor things. When Samantha was done with her dolls, they'd have to go back in their bins. Do your dolls want to be in my choir? Susie asked. Samantha didn't answer. Susie sniffed. She wrinkled her nose. The air smelled like spaghetti sauce and garlic bread. It also had... It also still had that other smell, the one she didn't understand. Well, fine. She didn't need Samantha's dolls to have a good choir. Making one final adjust adjustment, Susie picked up a ruler and taped it on the block she had set up in front of her dolls. Then she began waving the ruler back and forth the way she'd seen directors do it. Before Susie got through three waves, Samantha suddenly stood up and kicked Susie's dolls off their blocks. Then she kicked the blocks too. All the dolls and blocks tumbled over the fluffy rug and clattered onto the dark wood floor beyond. Susie winced. Now she'd have to set up a hospital with the blocks and heal her dolls. Oh, <laughs> Samantha glared at Susie before running out of the room. Susie thought about yelling after her, but fighting with Samantha never accomplished anything. She'd learned it was, it'd be better to be quiet and let things blow over. Even so, Susie's mum appeared in the doorway. Tall and skinny with dark brown hair, Susie's mum used to look like she could be a model. Susie remembered when her mum's hair was really shiny and bouncy, when her mum's big eyes were always made up with long fake eyelashes, and her m wide mouth was always painted with sassy red lipstick. Now her mum wore no makeup, and she looked tired. Dressed in faded jeans and a wrinkled blue t shirt, Susie's mum gazed at the toys on the rug. Susie got up and walked over to her. Mum, her mum kept staring at the toys. Are you okay? Tears filled her mum's eyes, and Susie felt like someone was squeezing at her heart. I feel like something is wrong, she told her mum. Something bad has happened, but I don't know what it is. Susie really wanted her mum to tell her everything was okay, but her mum just covered her mouth with her hand and let the tears spill from her eyes. Susie knew her mum wouldn't answer now. She never liked talking when she cried. And weren't the tears an answer anyway? Normally, after dinner, her mum would go to the third floor and work. She had a big studio up there because she was a textiles artist, making big modern quilts and woven blankets that people never used on their beds. Her mum's blankets were hung on walls, which Susie thought was weird, but her mum liked making them, and according to her mum, the pretty blankets paid the bills. Which was a good thing, because Dad wasn't here anymore. Susie didn't understand why he left, but he was gone. Was that a bad thing? Susie wrapped her arms around her knees. No, she didn't think so. She thought it was something else. She wondered if she should try to hug her mum. Probably not. Her mum didn't like to be hugged when, she, hugged when she cried. Susie just stood there, hoping her mum would stop so they could talk. But her mum didn't stop crying. She just pushed away from the door jam and, um, and walked away down the silent hallway. I see. Okay. I can kind of see where this story's going. I don't know, though. Let's keep reading. Samantha was outside, wandering around the front yard and blowing bubbles. Anyone watching her would think she was having fun, but Susie knew Samantha didn't blow bubbles for fun. She did it to study air currents. Susie, <laughs> Susie knew better than to ask if she could blow bubbles, too. Samantha would say no. It would mess up her research. But Susie wanted to be near her sister, so she wandered over to Oliver, patted him on his rough moist trunk 
and ducked inside the faded black tyre swing. Pushing off, off, pushing off from the ground, she got the swing going. Then she threw her head back to look up at the gloomy sky uh, as the swing spun in a lazy circle. The evening air was cold, but not too cold, and it had felt that full scent that Susie had heard others describe as crisp. She didn't know what crisp smelled like. She thought full air was a two-sided smell tart and musky at the same time. Oh, two-sided smell. Tart and musky at the same time. Sorry. And of course, the full air around her house still had that other smell that she didn't like. Susie closed her eyes and refreshed her spin. She could hear Samantha trotting around the yard. Oliver's dry leaves uh, ca crackled under her feet. Not cackled. Oh my gosh. Then Susie heard voices. She opened her eyes and turned so she could see the sidewalk. Long ago, their house was a farmhouse that sat in the middle of lots of land. But as the years went by and all of those great grandmas grew from little girls to old women, the family had to sell part of the land, so said Susie's mum. Eventually, Susie's grandma had sold the last of the land to someone called a developer, and the developer built a big subdivision that surrounded the house. The new houses were built to look a little like the old farmhouse. Susie's mum said they were all Victorian. But the new houses didn't have the personality of the old house. The new ones were all in serious colours like grey and tan and cream. Susie's house had lots of fun colours. Mainly it was yellow, but the trim, and there was a lot of trim, was purple, blue, pink, grey, orange and white. Susie's mum called the trim gingerbread, which made no sense to Susie because the trim wasn't made of cookies, although she wished it was. Susie always thought it looked like her house was dressed up to go out, and the other houses wore everyday work clothes all the time. The sidewalk in front of the new houses was wide, and it was closer to their house than Susie's mum wanted it to be. Susie didn't mind that. She liked watching people go by, especially from the tyre swing. A big laurel uh, hedge along the front of their yard blocked the view of Oliver's lower trunk and the tyre swing. Susie liked to stay there and play spy, watching people through the hedge without them knowing she was there. The group going by now had five kids in it. Oh no. <laughs> she was pretty sure they were in Samantha's class. Three of the kids, all girls, were wet walking bikes. A fourth kid, a tall boy, was messing around on a skateboard. And the final one, a smaller boy, was on a scooter. It didn't look like he knew exactly how to use it. Hurry up, Jeru! One of the girls snapped at the small boy. He was blonde, and his hair stuck up all over on his head. Yeah, another one of the girls said. Both girls had dark hair and they wore jeans and blue hoodies. This place is spooky. Susie slowed the tire swing and listened to the kids. Spooky? Did they sense it too? That thing that Susie didn't understand? Hey professor, the third girl called out. This girl has reddish hair and a black leather jacket hung open to show a light pink shirt underneath. Susie knew professor was Samantha. Even if the word hadn't been said in a sarcastic tone, Susie knew it was supposed to be an insult. Ever since Samantha started grade school, her, classes, her classmates had made fun of her for being too serious. Susie hated that the kids did that, and the first time it had happened, she tried to stick up for Samantha. What's wrong with being smart? She'd yelled at the kids, taunting her sister. You're just jealous that she knows more than you. Susie had thought Samantha would appreciate the support, but Samantha got upset. I don't need you to take care of me, she told Susie. I have to stand on my own two feet. Susie knew Samantha had gotten his, this expression from their grandma, but she didn't argue, and she never tried again to stop the kids from their teasing. So she didn't speak up now when one of the girls called out, Freak! Come on, Drew! The boy on the skateboard said to the boy with the scooter, I hate passing this house. The leather jacket girl said, Yeah, one of the other girls agreed, shivering. The third girl said, I used to play with them when I was in kindergarten. She was always serious. She pointed to Samantha. But she at least would talk to you. Now it's like she's... She shrugged. I don't know. The kids had passed the house, but Susie turned to watch them and she kept listening. You can't really blame her, the small boy said. Come on, Drew. The leather jacket girl said. Let's get, just get by, huh? When night came, it dropped on the house like someone up in a heaven abruptly threw a black blanket over everything. The girls got ready for bed as usual, and as usual, Sam Samantha didn't protest when Susie got into her bed. She knew Susie hated to sleep alone. Even so, Samantha always slept with her back to Susie, 
and she always slept as far from Susie as possible, especially now. Susie faced the window. Even though the window had a shade, it was never pulled. Susie's mum said the house should have as much light as possible, sunlight or moonlight. Susie liked to lie awake and look at the way the moonlight brought things to life in the room. The eerie glow cast shadows over Samantha's bins, making them look like big mouths trying to gobble the, the moon. She also liked to look at the stars and name them. Tonight, the stars were hiding, and only the faintest gleam from the moon's silver man oh sliv sliver sliver from the moon's sliver managed to push through the clouds. The only light coming into the room reached dimly from the porch lights over the front and back doors. The room was cold, and the cold bothered Samantha more than it did Susie. So the girls lay under the two thick, soft blankets. Susie shoved the blankets away from her mouth. Are you awake? Susie asked her sister. She kept her voice at a whisper. Samantha didn't answer. This wasn't unusual. She didn't like talking at night. But that didn't stop Susie. I keep having this bad feeling like something's wrong, she, Susie whispered. She didn't wait for a response. The world smells funny, she told her sister. She twisted up her mouth, trying to describe the smell. It reminds me of a little... It reminds me a little of when we leave leftovers in a container too long, and the mum tells us to clean them out, and we have to hold our nose and talk like this. She held her nose and talked in a funny voice that resulted. She giggled, at, she giggled at herself. Samantha remained silent. She never thought Susie's funny voices were all that funny. Maybe she was actually asleep. Susie held still, so Samantha's smooth blue sheets wouldn't make that shushing sound when you shifted in the bed. She focused on Samantha's breathing. It was deep and even. Susie pulled her legs up tighter and nestled her head further into the pillow. And Oliver's leaves aren't the right colour. They're not bright enough. Samantha breathed, in and out. And Mum is acting strange, you know? Samantha did not respond. Susie sighed. She closed her eyes and tried to go to sleep. Thump. Susie's, <laughs> Susie's eyes shot open. Had she fallen asleep? Did she dream that muffled sound that she just heard? She lay perfectly still, listening. Thump. 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 No, she didn't dream it. Someone or something was walking around on the porch. The sound of, was that of a big foot hitting the wooden boards. Susie sat up, clutching the smooth sheets and Samantha's soft white blankets. She cocked her head to listen closely. That's when she heard the taps between the thumps. Thump. Tap. Thump. Tap. Thump. Susie didn't move, but suddenly Samantha sat up. She immediately swung her legs over the side of the bed, but she didn't stand. She just sat there, her back rigid. You heard it too? Susie whispered. Samantha didn't reply, so Susie decided she had to do something on her own. She made herself let go of the covers, then dropped her legs out of the bed. She ignored the cold air that hit her ankles, and she padded out the room, out of the room, and down the stairs to the kitchen. Susie paused by the island and looked at the pale yellow glimmer creeping in through the kitchen window. Oh no, is it Chica? Is it is it Chica? No, surely not. It radiated from the porch light above her back floor. The digital the digital clock over the stove glowed red in a darkened room. Eleven fifty. The refrigerator hummed. The faucet dripped. It had dripped for quite some time. Susie knew one drip every ten seconds. She waited through two drips while she listened to the continued thumbtap sweet sequence outside on the porch. When the sounds faded enough to make her think that whatever was making the sound was on the opposite side of the house, she went to the back door, took a deep breath, and opened it. Just then, Samantha reached over Susie's shoulder and slammed the door. Susie whirled toward her sister. Samantha's eyes were huge, her lips were compressed, and for the first time since she'd said goodnight to her mum, Samantha spoke. There's nothing out there. Back to bed. She turned and marched out of the kitchen, making it abundantly clear that Susie was supposed to follow her. What? Okay. Jeannie's voice was so warm and strong that even when it came through the phone line it sounded like she was in the room. You're more than Susie's mum, Patricia, she said. Patricia held the phone to her ear with one hand while she brushed her limp hair with the other. She sat on the edge of the king-sized bed, the bed that was far too big for her alone. But it had been far too small for her and her husband, 
That's why he had to leave, so they could stop intruding into each other's space. Although why they although why they needed all that space was never too clear. And more than Samantha's room, Jeannie continued, you're you, and you'll just find yourself again, eventually. Patricia sighed. Samantha won't talk to me except to order me around. Jeannie laughed. She's her own woman. Patricia wasn't sure whether to laugh or cry at that. The idea of her eight-year-old daughter acting like a woman was amusing, but the idea that her daughter had been forced to turn into a pint-sized woman was not amusing at all. It will get better, Jeannie said. It always does. Patricia nodded even though Jeannie couldn't see her. Jeannie knew, would know she had nodded I like that. Patricia and Jeannie had been friends since they were Samantha's age. Together they'd gone through school, college and grad school, both in art. When Patricia married Hayden, Jeannie was her maid of honour, and when Patricia had her girls, Jeannie became their godmother. Jeannie was like the, the sister Patricia never had. I don't know if I'm doing this right, Patricia said. There is no right, Jeannie said. That made everything harder somehow. I wish. She stopped and froze. What did she just hear? Did that come from outside or inside? You there? Jeannie asked. Patricia stayed silent, listening. Patricia? Patricia shook her head. She was imagining things. She blew out air. I'm here. <laughs> oh no, what is happening? Susie had followed her sister back to bed, but now she was creeping away. This time, she paused for a second outside her mum's room. She was probably on the phone with Jeannie. They talked pretty much every day, either in person or on, on the phone. If Jeannie was in town, she'd come by, but she travelled a lot for her job. Her job was buying art for people. Susie thought that sounded like a very fun job. Susie lurked in the hallway, hoping to hear her mum laugh, but a laugh never came. Instead, the footsteps sounded again. Thud, tap, thud, tap. Susie put her shoulders back and turned toward the top of the stairs. Descending slowly, pausing on every step, Susie looked over the top of the waxed oak banister to the paned window at the front of the house. Sheer curtains blurred the outline of the porch rails and beyond them, Oliver's solid presence. He stood like a tireless guard in the middle of the front yard. Oops. <laughs> but the sheer curtains couldn't block the shape that Susie saw stalking past the windows on the front porch. The shape was too big to hide. All the curtains could do was distort it and disguise what it was. The shape moved slowly, deliberately, lurching in sync with the sound of its step. Thud. Tap. Thud. Tap. As it moved, its head swiveled. Every few steps, Susie could see the reflection of sharp eyes as they searched the interior of the house. Every time those eyes looked her way, Susie turned into stone, willing herself to disappear into the background. Even though she wanted to hide, Susie didn't go back to bed. She couldn't. She knew that. So she continued down the stairs, managing one step for every six footsteps she heard on the front porch. By the time she reached the first floor, the shape was passing the last of the tall windows on the left side of the house. Susie tiptoed ahead of it. Ducking into what used to be her dad's office, she watched the shape outside past the office window and head toward the kitchen side of the house. Hesitating only a moment in the empty room lined with dusty shelves, Susie pushed off the door jam and went into the kitchen for the second time that night. She crouched behind the island as the shape passed through the yellow light outside the kitchen window. Once it had moved on, heading back towards the front of the house, Susie stood. She clenched her fists, then released them and she went to the front door. The front door was as old as the house, built of thick wood and stained so many times the door always wanted to stick when you tried to open it. The carved front door reminded Susie that time couldn't be stopped, no matter how much you wanted it to be. But the footsteps paused. Susie listened. She heard nothing at all. She reached for the front doorknob and she opened the door. She opened the door in increments, two inches, six inches, a foot. She took a deep breath, stepped around the door, and looked up. She waited, like she always did, every night, frightening, familiar, persistent. <clears throat> Susie didn't cringe or tremble or jump back, even though it would have been reasonable for her to do any of or all of those things. Instead, she said, Is it time to go back already? Chica yelled out her, <laughs> held out her yellow hand. Her mouth didn't move. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It is Chica. That's crazy. Susie knew Chica wouldn't answer because Chica didn't talk to her. Susie turned away from the man-sized animatronic chick standing in front of her. 
She looked back up the stairs, longing. But longing didn't do any good. Susie looked back to the animatronic chick. Ignoring the gaping metal mouth with all the teeth, Susie focused on Chica's bright yellow body and the big white bib hanging around Chica's neck, the one that said, let's eat. Then she looked at the cupcake Chica held. Susie thought the cupcake was, sc was scarier than Chica. It had eyes and two buck teeth, and one candle stood up straight from the middle of it. Susie didn't know what the candle was for. One day, one year, one child. Letting Chica take her hand, Susie walked away from her house. Every step made her feel less like herself. By the time she passed Oliver's still falling leaves, she was lost. Patricia stared through the open front door at the oak tree that was dropping its leaves all over the front lawn. She had a feeling she'd just missed something important. Several minutes before, she'd heard the sound again. This time, she couldn't talk to herself, herself out of it. She left the bedroom and come out into the hallway. When she looked down the stairs, the front door was standing wide open. Heart racing, she'd run to Samantha's room and peered in. One glance showed her heart rate. Okay. Her worst nightmare wasn't playing out. But why was the front door open? Grabbing a pair of knitting needles and holding them in front of her like a knife, she crept through the house, checking for an intruder. There was nothing. Patricia closed the door, turned the deadbolt, and pressed her hands against the door, pushing with all her strength as if she could shove away reality, maybe press it into some other form. Pushing her hands, uh, pulling her hands back abruptly, stuck, sucked in her breath. There was something she hadn't considered. What if someone came through the still open door while she searched the house? She turned and ran up the stairs to Samantha's room. She nearly collapsed in relief. Everything was okay. Samantha was awake. She sat up in bed. The covers pulled up to her neck. Her fists clenched and her knuckles stark white. Tears made her eyes sparkle in the faint light from her bedside lamp. Patricia sat down next to her daughter. She wanted to pull Samantha into a tight hug and never let you go hug, but Samantha wouldn't like that, all she tolerated was the slightest touch. So Patricia briefly placed her hand on Samantha's shoulder before she said, I know you miss her, I miss her too. Samantha blinked and two tears escaped her eyes, me meandering down her lean cheeks. She didn't bother to wipe them away. Patricia sat next to Samantha for a long time, but neither mother nor daughter spoke again. Finally, Patricia stood kissed the top of her daughter's head, and returned to her huge bed. Samantha waited for her mother to leave before she moved. She lay on her back watching the light and shadow play cat and mouse on her ceiling. If Susie was here, she'd make up some story about the shadows and light, about them fighting each other or dancing or something. She was always making up things. Susie got that from their dad, even though their mum was the artist, and their dad was the one who went to work in a suit and tie and did stuff for business that neither Samantha nor Susie understood, he was the one who loved stories. In his free time, he was always either reading a book or watching a movie. He could make up good stories too. When he was home, the girls had always had an original story at bedtime. Their mum wouldn't even try to make up a story. I'll read you a story instead, she would say when their dad was out of town. Now she didn't say instead, she just asked what book she was reading tonight. One of the stories their dad made up was about a little boy who had, who had a secret place in a hidden room in his house. From that room he was able to solve all of his problems no matter where they were. Well no matter what they were, sorry. He told hundreds, hundreds of these stories, making up a new problem for the boy to solve each time. Susie was convinced these stories meant there was a secret room in their house. She always, be, uh, she always asked she was always asking their dad about it. His answer is always the same. He'd present to zip his lips shut and throw away an invisible key. Susie said she would. Susie said she thought the way to the secret room was in their dad's office at the back of the house. Samantha saw it was a story, and she was glad the office was always locked so Susie couldn't talk her into getting into trouble for looking for the secret room. Now the office wasn't locked because her dad was gone. But Susie no longer talked about looking for a secret room. Samantha pressed her lips together, disgusted uh, with herself for thinking about Susie and the stupid secret room. Then she thought about the sound she heard at night. She tried to convince herself she imagined them. That had to be true, because when she looked outside, she never saw anything at all. But lying here alone in the silence, in the strange halfway land of the night, 
She couldn't quite convince herself that she'd made it all up. She was pretty sure something had been outside, but what and why? In the brisk late morning air, Patricia and Jeannie sat side by side in the porch swing, padded with yellow floral cushions. Patricia was aware that, to any passers-by, she and Jeannie were part of an idyllic idyllic <laughs> idyllic scene. Both women wearing wide-brimmed straw hats to shade their faces from the sun that slanted onto the porch, sipped tea to ward off the fat full chill. They probably looked as relaxed as could be. They weren't, or at least Patricia wasn't. Patricia studied her friend. Jeannie was almost her perfect op opposite in size and colouring. Whereas Patricia was tall and thin with dark hair, Jeannie was short and plump with blonde hair. In spite of these differences, both women used to have one quality in common. They both smiled and laughed easily. Now, Patricia couldn't do that anymore. Patricia took a shaky breath. I'm wondering if I should take Samantha to a different counsellor. She cringed at the way her voice seemed to scar the air. Rhonda is nice, and Samantha likes her. I think, honestly, it's hard to tell. She waved away a uh, fly. But I talked to Rhoda last week, and she said... Samantha's stuck. Samantha is clearly keeping something to herself, but nothing Rhoda is doing will get her to talk. Samantha has always done things in her own way, Junie pointed out. She grinned. That child has an opinion about everything. Patricia attempted a smile, but only got about halfway there. Remember how she harangued Susie re relentlessly about naming that tree? Uh, Jeannie gestured at the ancient oak. What is his name? Oliver. Patricia started crying. Jeannie sat down her tea and took Patricia's hand. I'm sorry, that was insensitive. Patricia wiped her eyes and shook her head. It's been a year. I should... There aren't any shoulds when it comes to losing a child. Isn't that what your counsellor told you? Patricia nodded. No rule book. They sipped tea in silence for several minutes. Patricia watched Oliver drop another dozen leaves. The previous night's persistent breeze had taken hundreds of Oliver's remaining leaves. He didn't have many left on his gnarled branches. Pretty soon, he'd need a scarf. Jeannie patted Patricia's knee. You're thinking about Oliver's scarf. It made Patricia literally ache to think about how four-year-old Susie had run inside after Oliver had dropped his last leaf that first year she named him. When she'd returned, she held one of the neck scarves Jeannie had knitted for her. Patricia gazed at Oliver and felt like she could see the scene from three years before unfolding in front of her right now. The scene was a little fuzzy in places, but otherwise it was almost real. Her little arms crossed, her brow furrowed. Susie said, he'll get cold because he doesn't have leaves. Uh, she was dressed in a bright orange jacket. When Susie found out that the scarf wasn't big enough for Oliver, she was heartbroken until Patricia suggested Susie ask her godmother to knit a scarf specifically for Oliver. Now, Jeannie knitted a new scarf for Oliver every year. I've already knitted it, Jeannie whispered. Tears spilled down Patricia's cheeks. She, she was surprised she still had tears to cry. She was always anthropomorphizing. Oh my gosh, what is that word? <laughs> anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphizing? Okay, Patricia said. I never saw a problem with it. There wasn't a problem with it. She was an em em empathetic... <laughs> Why can't I read today? Empathetic child with a vivid imagination. Which is why she was so easily lured. Ooh. Empath empathetic. That's got something to do with agony and stuff. Uh, Patricia didn't realise her own voice. Normally soft, it was now as hard and rough as Oliver's bark. I should have discouraged her flights of fancy. I should have. Stop it! Jeannie shifted to face Patricia. Not all the murdered children were like Susie. Oh, missing children's isn't it? You don't know that it would have been different if she been a different kind of child. You can't keep trying to find reasons to blame yourself. Patricia looked down. I hated that place, she whispered. It always seemed creepy to me, but she, Ch Chica, but Susie loved it. Chica, Susie, same thing. <laughs> Jeannie frowned. Are you sure you want to go over this again? I need to. No, you don't. Yes, I do. I can't just forget. Why not? How are you helping Susie by torturing yourself with the details over and over? Patricia wanted to yell at Jeannie to shut up, but she didn't have the energy. Jeannie took both of Patricia's hands. Your daughter was murdered by a serial killer. She was lured to her death in a place where she, could, where she should have been safe. There, 
which dug it up again. Feel better? Patricia yanked her hands back and started to stand. Ginny grabbed her arm and held her in place, her grip pinching Patricia's skin. Don't run away! Ginny shouted. Then she lowered her voice but kept it firm, just shy of scolding. You can't dredge up the past and then run away from it if you insist on trotting it out to, to torture yourself regularly. At least you should do it head on. If you don't, you'll be running away your whole life and you'll never be able to let Susie go. A car zipped by on the road, its engine, rev its engine revving. The smell of exhaust wafted up to the porch. Something about the odour erased Patricia's anger. She was wearing her favourite sweater, the one you knitted for her, magenta with pink stripes, Junie said. She wanted sequins, Patricia said, and you wouldn't let me put any on the sweater. So you put rhinestones on her jeans instead? Junie laughed. You were really angry with me. Patricia wiped her eyes. Stupid thing to be angry about. Junie gently squished Patricia's arm, then let her go. A breeze curled up on the porch from the yard, and Patricia shivered. Susie watched Samantha lean on the rake and, um, and scowl at Oliver. Huh? Oh, okay. It's not his fault, Susie said. He can't help it that his leaves land on the ground when he lets them go, Samantha sighed. Susie tried not to be annoyed. I said I'd do it, she reminded Samantha. Right after they'd gotten home that afternoon, their mum said, Maybe you can do a little raking before dinner. Susie had said, I'll do it. But before Susie could get to the rake, Samantha grabbed it, and now she wouldn't let go. She'd rather do it right, and not like doing it, than let someone else do it wrong. Fine, let Samantha rake. Susie would hang out with Oliver. Listening to the rasp and scuff of the rake, Susie went around to the back side of his trunk, away from the road, and hugged him. Oliver smelled smoky and moist, laying the side of her face against his trunk. She listened. Sometimes, when she listened really hard, she was sure she could hear him breathing. Hi, Samantha. The greeting came from the sidewalk. Susie peered around Oliver to see who was calling out to her sister. It was Drew, the kid with the scooter and the blonde spiky hair. Today, he was alone. Holding onto his scooter, Drew looked across the yard. Samantha stared back at him as if he was uh, a bull about to charge her. Drew waved. I see you at school a lot, and I just thought I'd say hi. I'm Drew. Samantha glanced around like she suspect suspected a trap. Susie wanted to go to her side and encourage her to talk to the kid, but Samantha would hate that, so Susie stayed hidden and watched. Drew scratched his nose, and his scooter fell over. He bent to pick it up. Hi, Samantha said. Drew straightened and grinned. Samantha held the rake like a weapon. Susie didn't think that looked very friendly. Go over to him, Susie hissed at her sister. Samantha ignored her. Susie knew listening to someone else's conversation was rude, according to her mother, so she ran over to the side yard and started talking to the bedraggled plants in the flower beds. Why would they... oh, would they tell her why her mum was ignoring them? Samantha wished the boy would go away. She also w hoped he would stay. He was cute. Oh, <laughs> uh, Drew... oh, was, but was he just being nice or just messing around with her? Drew stepped closer so he was right at the edge of the sidewalk. Um, I was really sorry about what happened to your sister. Samantha looked down, but she managed to mumble. Thank you. She took a tentative step toward the sidewalk. Drew looked at Samantha. Then he looked up at the house. She, he lowered her, his voice. Do you ever see her? I'm so confused. <laughs> uh, did I miss something? <laughs> because Susie's there. What? I'm so confused. Is Susie a ghost now? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, Drew looked at Samantha. Then he looked up at the house. He lowered his voice. Do you ever see her? Samantha went still. She felt the blood rush from her face, and she gripped the rake so hard it hurt. Drew dropped his scooter and took several steps into the yard. Then he opened his mouth and words tumbled out so fast they piled up on top of each other. I'm not trying to be mean, and I'm not making fun, really. It's just that I believe in ghosts, and I think people who die can stay around if they want. Okay, I think Susie is a ghost. I had an uncle who died, and I saw him the night he died. And then he came back for a couple of years after that. He was waiting for my dad to forgive him for something. I think ghosts hang around if they want something, you know? So I was just asking, and I didn't mean to upset you. Dinner's ready in five, Samantha's mum called from the porch. She didn't notice Drew. Samantha had no idea what to say. So she just said, okay, then turned around to her head inside. 
Bye. Drew called. Okay. Okay, I think I get it now. I was so confused. One minute Susie's there, the next minute Drew comes up. He's like, oh, I'm sorry about your sister. <laughs> Samantha couldn't let... Samantha couldn't go to sleep because she kept thinking about Drew. About what he'd said. Thinking about Drew was kind of nice. Thinking about what he said was not. His words bounced around in her head. Ghosts hang around if they want something. A faint snick and swish came, sound came from downstairs. Samantha sat up. She knew exactly what that sound was. Should she go down or wait? The tremors that always started at that sound began at her feet and scrabbled up her legs. Ignoring them, she jumped out of bed and padded across her room and into the hall. No sound came from her mum's room. Nothing from downstairs now either. But was that just a cold draft? Samantha clenched her jaw and forced herself down the stairs. At the bottom she paused, then she tiptoed through the dining room and peered into the kitchen. As she knew it would be, the back door was standing wide open, and now she could hear the other noise, coming from the porch. Oh, <laughs> thud, tap, thud tap. Moaning, she pushed through her terror. She ran through the kitchen and she slammed and locked the back door. Then she sprinted as fast as she could get as she could back up to her bed. Once there, she tried to convince herself she was making everything up. In all the months she had been seeing her, Rhonda had never put her back to Samantha before. Was this some kind of test? Samantha frowned and tried to figure out what was going on. She looked around the room. It was plain and neat, the kind of room Samantha liked. All it had in it was a thick tan rug, Rhonda's listening chair, a cream-coloured plush chair with a low back and fat arms, a tan and cream striped sofa, and a child-sized wood table next to a trunk filled with toys. The room was interesting to Samantha because it extended out from the house, like a box, hovering about two feet off the ground. Three of the box's sides were glass. A long sigh from Rhonda made Samantha blink and Rhonda finally swiveled back to face her. I'm sorry, Rhonda said. I've been trying to figure something out. The crinkle between her thick black brows was unusual. Rhonda didn't frown. Mostly she smiled too much, in Samantha's opinion. It wasn't normal, especially for someone who listened to other people's problems all day. I like figuring things out, Samantha said. I know you do. Rhonda brushed her back her long black hair. Samantha stared at Rhonda's big brown eyes. So what are you trying to figure out? She said. I'm trying to figure out how to keep mum from sending you to someone else. Samantha jerked her head up. Why does my mum want to send me to someplace else? Because you're not making progress with me. What does that mean? Rhonda leaned forward. Samantha, I know something is stuck in your head. A thought. A belief. Something you th keep thinking is trapped there in your brain and you're not letting it out. Rhonda was right, but Samantha didn't tell her that. Samantha stared at her neatly tied navy blue sneakers. She liked things to be in their right places. She didn't like messy. Change was messy. Therapy was messy too. Before she'd started seeing Rhonda, her mum had taken her to two other people who were there to help her. Both had wanted her to play with a messy pile of toys in a messy room. She'd begged her mum not to make her go back. Finally, her mum brought her here. She didn't love it here, but she didn't hate it either. Rhonda was different. This room was different. Samantha was okay with them both. We had a fight, she said. She had to tell Rhonda what was stuck so her mum wouldn't make her go someplace else. You and Susie? Samantha nodded. Okay, Rhonda scribbled on her notepad. That used to bug Samantha, the scribbling, but she'd gotten used to it. It was about Grechen. <laughs> Grechen? Gretchen? Why do they have to have complicated names? Ah! Oh, it was about Greg. <laughs> Let's call him Greg. Oh no, no, because no, that's going to be confusing with fetch. I'm, I'm calling him Greg. It was about Greg. Who's Greg? The doll man. <laughs> oh no. It's a doll. It's a doll. Okay, we got a doll called Greg. The doll my mum said we had to share. Whose doll was it? Mum gave it to both of us together. Samantha rolled her eyes. I hated that. I want mine to be mine. I don't take Susie's stuff. So I should have my own stuff. Okay. But mum said we had to share. Rhonda nodded. So I tried to explain to Susie that we should that we should each get Greg for a certain time. When Greg was with me, <laughs> she'd study. Sorry, I can't stop laughing at Greg. Rhonda smiled and nodded again. Susie got upset about that. She said Greg didn't like to study. Greg liked to go to the zoo. 
She wanted Greg to hang out with her stuffed animals all the time. She said if Greg had to study, she'd be sad. Samantha stopped and remembered Susie standing in her room, hands on her hips. Le her lower lip jutted out. When Samantha insisted that Greg needed to study, Susie threw a tantrum. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, give me a sec. <clears throat> she cried, but she'd hate, but she'll hate that. So what happened? Rhonda asked. Samantha swung her legs. When I tried to put Greg in front of a book, Susie grabbed her and ran off. Why can't? Why am I laughing at Greg? Why? This didn't happen in Fetch. Oh my god. She what? Samantha counted her breaths the way Rhonda had taught her. It was supposed to help with the feeling um, that bugs were crawling up her legs. One, two, three, four. On the fourth exhale, Samantha said she ran away and hid Greg. Then she came back and told me what she'd done. I told her I'd find Greg, and Susie was upset again. Before that night, she told me she was going to find a better place for Greg, and I'd never find her now. Samantha fisted her hands and held them in front of her face. Then she said, I think she was thinking about where to hide Greg, and that's why she got taken. She thought whoever took her would help her hide this stupid doll. Rhonda took a deep breath. Thank you for telling me. Am I not stuck anymore? I don't think you are. Samantha nodded once. Good. Where is the doll now? Rhonda asked. I haven't found it. Oh, okay. I see where this is going. <laughs> I def I see where this is going. <laughs> Susie thought Samantha was unusually talkative today. She hadn't shut up since their mum had picked her up from the funny glass house Samantha visited three times a week. Even though Samantha was talking about boring stuff, about multiplying and dividing fives, their mums seemed to be okay with listening. She kept nodding as, as she drove through traffic. She didn't smile though, neither did Samantha. Samantha was so stiff, she looked like a robot. She sounded like a robot too. It was weird. She was talking as if she had to talk or something bad was happening. If she had to talk, couldn't she talk about something good? How about we talk about cute things? Su Susie asked. Samantha and her mum must have not heard her because Samantha kept talking about numbers and math. Susie sighed. Susie, you're a ghost. Did you not know that? <laughs> what was the point in hanging out with them if they were going to ignore her? Susie turned and looked at Samantha's right ear. Samantha's ears weren't pierced like Susie's were. Susie liked to wear pretty coloured earrings. Samantha refused to have hers pierced because she didn't want holes in her ears. Susie wondered, if I blow hard enough, can I push all the boring words out of her head? <laughs> Me. Turning, Susie blew as hard as she could into Samantha's ears. Samantha stopped talking. Ha! Susie grinned. Were you done with your story? Susie's mum asked Samantha. Samantha didn't answer. She sat perfectly still in her seat. Susie wasn't sure the silence was any better than the non-stop chatter. It wasn't a soft, comfortable silence, like a cushy plush bear. It was a sharp silence, like the pointy ends of metal things poking at your skin. The silence hurt her ears and her heart. Susie started singing to drown out the silence. No one sang with her, but she didn't care. She sang until Susie's mum turned onto the road. Then Susie stopped and waited eagerly to spot her house and check on Oliver. Susie's mum paused to wait for a car to pass before turning into their driveway. The car's blinker did its click tick until Susie's mum made the turn. Susie mimicked the noise. No one told her to stop. Oliver had lost a lot more leaves. He only had a few left. Would they last long enough? Susie sat on the end of Samantha's bed and watched her sister read a book. Samantha seemed tense. She held the book stiffly and she took a long time to turn the pages. I have a confession, Susie said. Samantha didn't look up. I miss you guys when we're apart. And I know you miss me too. Samantha turned a page. Her hand trembled. And I miss Greg. Do you miss her? Oh wait, it's a girl. It's a girl doll. Of course it is. <laughs> and I miss Greg. Do you miss him too? <laughs> Samantha kept reading. Susie never liked it when Samantha ignored her, but she couldn't. But she didn't let it shut her up. I don't know why, but I can't remember where I hid Greg. S Susie chewed on a knuckle. I don't think she stopped talking. This wasn't working. Samantha wasn't going to help her. Why couldn't Susie remember where she hid Greg? 
She remembered how angry and upset she was that Samantha was going to make Greg study. Greg was a sensitive doll. Freckled and curly, blonde-haired, Greg's stof- soft, round face was painted with a shy smile, the kind of smile that told Susie that she was easily scared. When Susie hid Greg, she'd been wearing a pink and purple polka dot dress that Jeannie made. The dress was supposed to be fun. It was supposed to help Greg be happier. But then Samantha was going to put pressure on Greg to learn stuff. Not even polka dots could win out over that. Susie knew that Greg still needed to be with her. Susie was the only person who understood her. She knew what it was like to want to be happy and have fun in a world that wanted you to learn and keep getting better at things. She couldn't leave Greg alone, lost in some forgotten hiding spot. She wished Samantha would listen. Susie reached over the book Samantha was holding. She waved her hand around. Samantha's face got white and she held very still. What was she thinking? Susie wondered. She would have asked, but she knew Samantha wouldn't answer her. Sometimes Samantha acted like this, and sometimes Samantha acted normal. Their grandma used to say, that's Samantha, she's a hard child to read, but Susie is an open book. If Susie was so open, why couldn't Samantha get what Susie was trying to tell her? How could Susie make Samantha understand? Samantha leaped out of bed and put her book neatly on the corner of her desk. Sitting in her straight-backed white desk chair, she opened a drawer and pulled out construction paper and crayons. That was it. Maybe Susie could draw a picture. Samantha would see it and remember Greg. Or maybe if Susie drew a picture, she'd remember where she'd hidden Greg. Susie stared at the paper and crayons. Would Samantha share? Samantha, could you come here please? Their mother called. Perfect. Susie waited for Samantha to leave the room and then she stole a pink piece of paper and a purple crayon that had barely been used. She plunked herself down on Samantha's blue rug and stretched out on her stomach. Tucking her tongue firmly between her lips, Susie started drawing. It took all of her concentration to make sure the drawing showed up on the page, but it did. Drawing was all she could do. If she wrote a note, Samantha wouldn't read it. Don't draw too long, Susie's mum said, out in the hallway. I'll be in to tuck you in soon. Susie heard Samantha's footsteps coming. She hurried to finish her drawing. When she was done, she left it, lying on the floor, and retreated to the window seat. Tucking herself into a small ball, Susie looked out the window. She couldn't see Oliver because the window reflected Samantha's bright room. She could see, though, a couple of leaves pushing against the window. Leaning forward, she realised that they belonged to Ivy, the vine that climbed up the trellis above the porch roof. Susie smiled. She remembered when her dad had put that trellis on the house. Her mum's Ivy, which Susie had named Ivy, of course, (laughs) of course, yeah, had climbed up the porch posts at the front of the house, and her mum had wanted to cut it. Susie thought that that would be sad. Can't you let Ivy climb higher? She'd asked. Her mum said, Well, if we had a trellis. Now it looked like Ivy had reached the top of the trellis and was trying to climb into Samantha's room. Would Ivy had better luck getting Samantha to talk? Samantha burst into her room and headed toward her desk. If she wanted to finish her drawing tonight, she'd have to hurry. Before she reached her desk, though, Samantha noticed something on the floor. Nothing besides the rug was supposed to be on the floor, but a piece of pink paper lay on it. The paper hadn't been there when she left the room. She was sure of it. Her mum had been with, with her downstairs the whole time. No one else was in the house. That meant Samantha didn't want to look. If she looked, no longer in a hurry to draw, Samantha stared at the pink paper for a very long time. Eventually, She convinced herself that picking it up was better than letting it lie there. As long as it was on the floor, Samantha could come up with all kinds of scary reasons for it to be there. If she picked it up, she didn't know what it was for sure. Susie always thought Samantha didn't have much imagination. That wasn't true. The problem was Samantha had way too much imagination. She had so much imagination that she could scare herself with silly with just a thought or two. Taking slow, quiet steps, Samantha walked toward the rug. She didn't take her eyes off the paper as she walked. She couldn't have said why. Did she think it was going to leap off the floor and attack her? And do what? Give her paper cuts? Samantha had gotten one of those when she was little. Susie had cried when she saw the blood. Samantha didn't. Yes, it stung a little, but she thought it was more interesting than painful. How could something as flimsy as paper cut you? When Samantha picked up the paper, she saw some squiggly purple lines. But as she gazed at the paper and the squiggly lines, They began to form into shapes that made some kind of sense. 
The drawing had three parts, like the panels in newspaper comics. The first part, on the far left of the page, was a drawing of two little girls. One had a ponytail, and one had hair that was flying all around her face. The flying haired girl held what looked like a mirror in one hand. She extended the mirror out toward what seemed to be a baby floating in the air. The other hand was held out to the ponytailed girl. Between the baby and the girl, a big chick with spiky teeth held up its hands. Huh? The second part of the drawing, which was separated from the first part by a vertical line, showed the moon over a house that looked like a that looked a little like Samantha's house. The flying haired girl was walking away from the house, holding hands with this, that same big chick. To the right of this second drawing, another vertical line separated the second drawing from the third one. The third one also had a moon, a house, and the flying haired girl walking away hand in hand with the chick. But after the third drawing, there was a heavy dark line. Samantha could see where the crayon had been moved over and over until it created a thick slashing shape that Samantha didn't understand. Frowning, she stared at the picture. Had she, had she drawn it and for, then forgotten? If only she could believe that. I wish you could just talk to me, Susie whispered. I miss when we used to talk. I know you thought I talked too much, but you still listened. I'd really like someone to listen. She was so frustrated. This reminded her of playing charades. Once, she'd played charades at her friend's, at her friend's Chloe's birthday party. <clears throat> Susie liked all games, but charades wasn't as fun as she wanted it to be. She'd thought she was being so clear with her acted out clues, but no one got what she was trying to make them see. That is a reference to Scott Cawthon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no one guessed right. When she told her mum about it later, her mum said, You don't think the same way other people do. That's a good thing. You're super creative. Not created enough, Susie thought as she stared in at the drawing she'd left on the rug. What else could she do? Jumping up from the window seat. Susie ran to Samantha's desk. She noticed Samantha looked up from the pink and purple drawing when she rushed past, but Susie didn't bother to say anything. When Samantha was acting like this, there was no point. Besides, Susie wanted to draw something else. At Samantha's desk, Susie grabbed a piece of pale yellow paper and a black crayon. She flopped down in Samantha's desk chair and started again. Interesting. Samantha had felt the air shift, but she didn't want to think about why it shifted. She also knew, somehow, that she couldn't turn around. Samantha covered her mouth with her hand so she wouldn't giggle. Samantha wasn't normally a giggler. Well, sometimes her dad could get her to giggle by tickling her, but this wasn't a tickle giggle. This giggle came from some terrified place instead of her, a place where she was hysterical. That was a word her dad often used for her mother before he left them all. Samantha didn't want to be hysterical. She counted her breaths like she did in therapy. One, two, three, four. The air in Samantha's room had become thick and sticky, like molasses. <laughs> Samantha didn't know what would make the air, air feel like molasses. But it didn't feel right to be inside of air like that. She had to get out of here. Leaving the drawing where she found it, she started to run from the room, but at the doorway, she stopped. Something was lying on her desk, another drawing. Samantha winced and shrank away, but she couldn't remove her gaze. Like the first drawing, this one had three boxes. In the first, the same flying haired girl was walking away from the front door of the same house. The moon was a thin sli sil the, uh, w the moon was a thin sliver, kind of like the moon Samantha had seen the previous night. Ooh. In the second box, the same girl was walking away from the same door but the moon was a bigger sliver. And then, in the third box, the girl wasn't even there. The box just showed the house's door, and an even bigger moon. Are you ready for bed? Samantha's mum called. Ignoring the weird air in the room, Samantha gathered, gathered the drawings and shoved them under her covers. She should look at them later, by flashlight. Susie, Susie usually waited until their mummy left to crawl into bed um, with her sister. But tonight was different. She didn't want to waste a second being apart. Curling up on the window side of Samantha's bed, Susie watched Samantha go through her funny bedtime ritual. First, Samantha had to sit at her desk and write a paragraph, at least a paragraph, in her diary. Then, she had to go across the hall to the bathroom and brush her teeth. Then she had to pee, and then she had to drink half a glass of water. That will just make you have to pee again, Susie had told her sister one night. 
Samantha just stuck out her tongue. After the water, Samantha focused... Uh, what? Focused? What? Touched her toes. Uh, not focused. Four times. And she brushed her hair 50 times. Then she went to her doll bin and said goodnight to her dolls. Then she got in bed. None of these things were funny by themselves, but the way Samantha did them all was the same way every night in the same order was funny. At least to Susie. Tonight the routine was a tiny bit different because Samantha got her small flashlight from her nightstand drawer. When Samantha slid under the covers, she pushed the flashlight under the covers with the drawings she'd stuffed under there, and the drawings crinkled. Susie listened to them rustle as Samantha shoved them further down and then arranged herself sort of like a sleeping princess. Finally, she called out, I'm ready, mum. Susie studied Samantha's profile while they waited for their mum to come into the room. Samantha had a little bump on her nose about halfway up from the rounded tip. Susie liked that bump. Susie didn't have a bump, and she thought bumps made noses interesting. She also liked the little check mark shape scar under Samantha's right eye. Susie did have a scar, but hers was hidden under the hair at the top of her forehead. Susie got her scar because she was doing something she wasn't supposed to. Samantha got her scar because Susie was doing something she wasn't supposed to. Susie loved to climb on things when she was little. One of her favourite things to do was get up on the porch rail and try to walk all the way around, around the house on it. She was good at balancing on the rail, um, but climbing around the posts that held it up could be hard because her arms were too short to wrap around them. She fell, to, she fell a lot, uh, usually landing in her mum's flower beds and getting in trouble. Their mum was super serious about flowers. One day, while Susie was brushing off the dirt from her latest fall, Samantha said, There's a better way to get around the posts. Who says? I say. How do you know? I just do, and I know how to do it too. Okay, then show me, Susie said. No. Mum said not to get up there. Well, then why did you say that? Because there's a better way. But if you're not going to show it to me, who cares if there's a better way? You're just being a know-it-all. I'm not. R2. The girls faced off next to the yellow begonias, begonias? I think that's a flower, they, to the yellow flowers at the side of the house. Hands on hips, uh, they glared at each other, practically nose to nose. Even though Susie was a year older, she wasn't any taller than her sister. I think you're lying about a better way, Susie said. I'm not lying. Yes you are. No I'm not. By now, they were yelling. What are you girls fighting about? Their mum called. She was inside the house doing laundry and Susie wanted her to stay there so she, they could keep playing. She leaned towards Samantha until they touched noses, and she whispered, Yes, you are. Samantha made her Pekingese face and said, Fine. Then she marched around Susie and climbed up onto the railing next to one of the posts. Susie's mouth dropped open. Samantha put her back to the post. See, you have to go around it facing out, not facing in. That way, the weight of your butt doesn't pull you off the railing. Samantha started to demonstrate but her foot slipped. She lost her grip and fell forward off the railing and into the flower bed. Susie had fallen there before and just gotten dirty, but somehow Samantha's face struck the top of one of the stakes holding up their mum's clematis. I don't know, I don't know flower names. <laughs> Samantha was mad at Susie for days after that, but not only because she had to have stitches, but, but because she got in just as much trouble for being on the railing. It was her idea, Samantha had yelled, pointing at Susie. You know better than that, their mother said to Samantha. You don't do anything you don't want to do. She was right about that. Like now. Not that story, Samantha was saying to their mum. I want you to read the one about the happy ghost. Susie smiled. This has become Sam Samantha's favourite story lately. Susie's mum looked like she was going to argue. But then she just sighed and picked up the top book from the neat pile on Samantha's nightstand. Susie's mum sat on the edge of the bed. Susie wished she could do something for her mum. She looked so pale. No, more than pale. She looked like her skin was turning invisible. Susie could see her mum's veins crawling over her forehead and up her arms and, uh, and hands. They looked like blue worms. The first time Susie had seen veins like that on an old lady, she thought they were worms, and she screamed. Her mum had explained what the blue jagged lines were. In a tall old house on the top of a tall old mountain, the tall old ghost floated through the main hall, Susie's mum began reading. Susie plumped the window under her head and scooted closer to Samantha. Samantha Samantha's breath caught and she turned into a Samantha log, as if an evil witch had suddenly frozen her. Susie sniffed and backed away. 
Why was Samantha so mad at her? The tall old ghost in the tall old house wasn't a pretty ghost, Susie's mum read, but he was a happy ghost. He was a very, very happy ghost. Susie noticed her mum's eyes were shiny and wet. Susie also noticed her mum's voice sounded choked and crackly. Keep going, Samantha said. Their mother sighed again. Susie's mum returned to the familiar story about the ghost who was happy because he got to spend forever with his family until he found out he couldn't spend forever with them since they were moving. That part always made Susie as sad as it made the ghost in the story. She couldn't imagine moving out of the house. Who would take care of Oliver? Susie's mum read quickly until she got to the part where the ghost found out that if he went away from the house to a special place of sparkly light where the truly happy ghost hung out, the ghost could never be separated from his family, no matter where they went. She slowed down over that part, and she cleared her throat a lot. Susie thought it would be very nice to be in a place where you'd never be separated from your family. She loved being with her mum and Samantha. Samantha could be a pain, but she was Susie's sister. When the story was done, Susie's mum stood hesitated and went to the door. Sleep sweet, she said. Susie wished her mum would kiss and hug them goodnight like she used to, but Samantha had decided they were too old for that, and she wouldn't let her mum do that anymore. Apparently, her mum thought Susie agreed with Samantha, but she didn't. As soon as her mum turned out the light, Samantha curled onto her side. Good night, Samantha, Susie said, but her sister didn't respond. Susie shrugged and curled into a ball facing the window. She looked at the skinny, curved piece of the moon, that peeked into the room. Its light wasn't bright enough to see by, but it was bright enough to make a lot of funny shadows. Two of the shadows looked like dancing hippopotamuses, and <laughs> three of them combined to look like a clown riding a horse. One of them looked a little like... Susie closed her eyes. She listened to Samantha breathe, and she wondered if her sister had understood the drawings. Samantha hadn't said anything before she stuffed them under her covers. Why did she even put them there? Outside, a dull thud sounded on the porch. Already? Susie didn't want to leave yet. She was hoping Samantha would take another look at the drawings. She just had to figure them out. The thud was followed by a faint squeak, the sound of the porch swing moving. Then the thud turned into a footstep pattern Susie was so used to. Thud, tap, thud, tap. Why did that sound make her skin, skin crawl? Why did she feel like she should know what was out there? Why did she feel like she had to know? Susie pushed back the covers and got out of bed as if something was pulling her from its safety. It was like one of those tractor beams she had seen in the space movies her dad liked to watch. She had no control. She wanted to stay in the nice warm bed, but instead she walked out of the room and down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, she listened to the footsteps and she watched a large shadow pass the dining room window. Once it passed, she trotted into the kitchen and opened the back door. She waited. Sometimes Samantha would come and slam the back door, and they'd go back to bed, but not tonight. Tonight, Susie could only stand there, listening to the footsteps come closer and closer. At the last minute, just before the steps came around the corner, she closed the kitchen door. She tried to go back upstairs, but she couldn't. Instead, her feet took her to the entryway. The house had a really big entryway, a formal entryway, her mum called it. She'd told Susie that, in the old days, there used to be a round table in the middle of the entryway. The table always held a vase full of flowers from the kitchen. But Susie's mum had put the table away when Susie's first walking had turned into wild running because Susie kept bumping into the table and knocking off the vase. She broke seven vases before I gave up, Susie's mum liked to tell people. She never said it like she was mad. It seemed to make her happy for some reason. Now the big entryway held only a maroon and navy blue braided rug. Susie went to the middle of the rug and waited. When the shadows shifted outside and the shape circling the house approached the front door, Susie stepped forward and opened it. As Susie knew she would be, Chica stood tall and stiff outside the front door. The porch light played with Chica's yellow body, making it look like the animatronic was breathing. Susie looked up at, the, at Chica's pinkish, purplish eyes. Did Chica's big black eyebrows just move? Susie looked down quickly. Chica's orange feet were planted on the welcome mat, one foot over the W and one foot over the M. As always, Susie hesitated, but then she did as she knew she must. She held out her hand and let Chica enclose her stiff, cold fingers over her own. Chica walked, turned and walked towards the steps leading down to the leaf-covered front lawn. Susie had no choice but to go along. 
Now the small taps of her own footsteps joined with Chica's, and leaves crunched under their feet as they left Susie's house behind them. Uh-huh, okay. I'm very confused. <laughs> in hushed stillness, Samantha listened to be sure her mother was in her room. She had to listen hard because the thick walls blocked little sounds. Eventually, though, she heard a creak she recognised as her mother's bed. She waited a few more minutes before turning on the flashlight under her covers and reaching for the drawings. Samantha almost didn't need to see them. They'd been on her mind since the moment they appeared. In that time, she let herself admit that she knew the first picture was of her and Susie. But what did it mean? Tenting her sheet and blanket, she aimed her flashlight at the drawing of the little girls. At first, Samantha thought the flying-haired girl, Susie, held a mirror, but she quickly realised it was a magnifying glass. It looked like the one her dad used to have in his desk drawer in his office, the one he sometimes let the girls use to look at things up close. Samantha had forgotten seeing Oliver's wood bark up close. It was like seeing a whole other world. Susie could name things all she wanted, but Samantha would rather study them. That's why she used the magnifying. What? That's what she used the magnifying glass for. Close-up study. Susie, though, Susie though, used it to hunt. After Susie used the glass to look at a caterpillar up close, she decided to use it to find teeny tiny insects in the lawn. She was sure she was going to find something no one had ever seen before. When Samantha used the glass to look over at Oliver's bark, Susie grabbed it and aimed it at a different part of his trunk. Maybe we'll find some elves, she said. Okay, so if Susie was holding a magnifying glass, she was looking for something. But what? The floating baby? Oh, no, not a baby. The floating thing was a doll. Oh, Greg! <laughs> um, Samantha frowned. If Susie was looking for a doll, there was only one doll missing. It had to be Greg. So Susie wanted her back. But what about the chick? What was that? Susie didn't understand the toothy chick. And what did the other drawing mean? Samantha aimed her flashlight at the second drawing. It was just as she remembered. Three panels with the flying haired girl walking away from a door in the first two, just the door in the third, and moons that were a little bigger in each panel. What did that mean? What if the moons getting bigger meant that each panel was a different day? Like tonight, tomorrow night, and the next night? Samantha thought about her little sister, the doll and the moons. She got it. Turning off the flashlight, she thought, Susie's only going to be here for two more nights. She was pretty sure she had it right, but the chick, what's the chick there for? She whispered. Susie, of course, didn't answer because she was gone. Oh, okay. So Samantha thinks it's the next two days, but Susie meant this is my last day. Ah, okay, okay. I think that's what it means anyway. <laughs> I might be wrong. Samantha's alarm woke her before the sun came up. Thankfully, she was a light sleeper, so it didn't take much volume for her to hear it, and she was sure it wouldn't disturb her mum. Her mum had trouble going to sleep, but once she was asleep, she had just as much, as much trouble waking up. Samantha had overheard her mum telling Jeannie that she could only sleep with the help of pills. The pills seemed to make mornings really hard, and Samantha had learned not to talk to her mum before school. Once, Samantha had forgotten part of her school project, she and her mum were rushing around already because mum had overslept. They had finally run out of the house into the car and her mum had driven her only as far as the bottom of their driveway when Samantha realised that she'd left something behind in her room. I have to go back, she said. Her mum hit the brake so hard, Samantha's head shot forward and back. She figured her mum would quickly drive back up to the house. Instead, her mum bent over and pounded her heel several times on the steering wheel. She whispered something over and over while she did it. Samantha thought it sounded like, I can't do this. Now, Samantha laid in the dark, holding her alarm clock for several minutes. She didn't like getting up early. Susie, Susie had been the one who always wanted to top out of bed and start playing before the sun was up. Susie was like their dad, who said the best part of the day was just before dawn, when everything was in a state of possibility. Smell that air, he'd say to Samantha on the first few mornings he was able to talk her into getting up early. Look at that pink light. It's so pretty, Susie would squeal. Not pretty enough to get early for. To get up early for, Samantha thought. This morning, though, it wasn't the smell or the colour that got Samantha out of bed. It was what she needed to do. She only had two more days to find Greg. She didn't know what would happen if she didn't find Greg. 
she didn't understand why a missing doll would mean so much to her dead sister. Susie was a ghost, wasn't she? Why would a ghost want something like a doll? But it didn't matter. Susie wanted it, and after what had happened to her, she deserved to get everything she wanted. Samantha threw back the covers. Cold air hit her bare legs, and goosebumps prickled her skin. She ignored her desire to dive back into bed. Instead, she stood, letting the thick, soft material of her blue flannel nightgown block some of the cold air. She stuffed her feet into the leather Macassian slippers Jeannie had gotten for her. Um, oh my gosh, I'm so confused, sorry. Her leather slippers Jeannie had gotten for her. Samantha didn't like fuzzy animal slippers like Susie did. Grabbed the clothes she'd laid out during the night and trotted into the bathroom on tiptoe. Thankful for the little space heater that, that sat on a sturdy footstool by the bathroom door, Samantha turned it on and stood in front of it a couple minutes to warm up. Then she did a short version of her morning routine before, she getting, she, before getting dressed. After she realized what Susie's drawings meant, Samantha had tried to stay awake long enough for her mum's pills to work so she could start looking for Greg. But she kept hearing her mum's bed, bed creak, which meant her mum was not deeply asleep. Samantha's eyes had started to close, so she'd set her alarm for the morning. When she finished in the bathroom, Samantha turned off the heater and opened the door. Stepping into the hallway, she stood on the dark green braided runner and thought it was, and thought about where Susie might have hidden Greg. Samantha glanced at uh, Susie's closed door. She shook her head. The doll wouldn't be in there. When Samantha and Susie had th thought about Greg, uh, Susie was upset as she could as she could possibly get. She wouldn't have put the doll in her room, where Samantha could easily find it, and even if it was there, that was going to be the last place Samantha looked. She hadn't been in Susie's room since that horrible night when Samantha went down the hall toward the stairs. If she was going to look for the doll, she would do it in an organised way. It would make sense to start at the bottom of the house and work up. Besides, on the first floor, there was less chance she'd wake her mum. The porch light's pale yellow glow stretched up the stairs toward the lead glass window in the front door. The light was mottled and eerie. How can glass be lead? I think I'm reading that right. <laughs> How can glass be lead? Susie had asked when their dad had told them what, that the glass, what the glass in the door was called. Samantha smiled now as she walked down the stairs. Susie was always asking questions like that. Samantha was never really sure if Susie was being funny or dumb. At the bottom of the stairs, Samantha looked both ways. She could go either into the dining room or the living room. Besides the kitchen, the only other rooms on the first floor were the small bathroom and her dad's office. She doubted the doll would be in either of those rooms, because there weren't any hiding places in there. She started in the dining room. The dining room was at least double the size of any dining room Samantha had seen on TV. She couldn't really compare it with other people's dining rooms because she hadn't seen any others. She didn't have any friends. When Susie was alive, Samantha was sometimes invited to parties that Susie went to, but she stopped going after attending a couple. They were stupid and boring and the kids were always mean to her. Samantha wiped her forehead to brush away her memories. She turned on the wall switch so the, so the light fixture over the table would come on low. The light was a big metal wheel with fake candles along its rim. Junie said that the light fixture uh, was farmhouse style, which made sense. Why is it called a fixture? Sa Susie asked when they were little. It doesn't fix anything. Samantha crossed to the tall carved hutch that sat behind one side of the long dark dining table. She opened her, the lower doors. The hutch was full of china and crystal, dishes and glasses their family had never used. She peered behind the stacks of plates and bowls. No Greg. <laughs> Moving on to the long low cabinet at the back of the room, the sideboard, Jeannie called it. Samantha opened all the, com the compartments and found lots of serving platters and vases. No Greg. She went to the front of the room and opened the lid of the window seat. It was filled with tablecloths and napkins. Just to be sure, she dug under, the, under and between the stacks. No doll. She went into the living room next. Outside on the street, she had the roar of a garbage truck emptying trash cans in front of all the houses. She chewed her lower lip. Would the garbage truck wake her mum? She'd better hurry. The living room was big and filled with puffy, com comfy furniture. It was too bad they hardly ever used it. Samantha looked longingly at the long, played sofa that faced the stone fireplace at one end of the room. Two solid, burgundy love seats joined the sofa to make a U-shape. 
filled in at the corners with chunky oak end tables and centering around a square green ottoman. This was the place where their family used to play games by the fire. At the other end of the living room was another big sofa, and a couple of recliner chairs faced a flat screen TV. Sometimes her mum would let Samantha watch that TV, but most of the time she was supposed to watch shows on the computer in her room. Around the edges of the room, built-in oak shelves and cabinets were stuffed with books and pictures and frames. Samantha remembered Susie's feelings about those shelves and some of the other furniture. Oak? Susie said one day when she was about, to, when she was about six. Oak? Like Oliver? Furniture is made from wood, their dad said, and wood comes from trees. So they kill trees to make furniture? Susie squealed. Their parents had spent most of, the, most of an hour trying to convince her that trees didn't feel pain when they were cut down. They never succeeded. Susie was sure the trees hurt. Samantha started searching all of the cabinets, beginning at the front corner and working clockwise around. When she didn't find anything, she felt behind all the books on the shelves, but she could only reach the bottom three rows. She trotted into the kitchen pantry and got the stepladder that was kept in there. Defying her orderly plan, she, sh she searched the pantry while she was there. She found evidence that someone, other than her, had been hiding sweets an old hardened bag of marshmallows, two half-eaten packages of chocolate chip cookies, an unopened box of old-fashioned donuts with a sell-it-by date that was a year ago, and a metal container of hard butterscotch candies that were all stuck together. But she didn't find Greg. Greg! <laughs> Where are you? Dragging the stepladder back into the living room, she climbed up and down it 14 times to look behind books and pictures. She found nothing but a lot of dust, which made her sad, because her mother used to want the house to be spick and span. She remembered how the house used to, be, how it used to smell like lemons from the spray her mum used when she, was, when she dusted. Now, it just smelled like dust. When she'd exhausted all of the living room hiding spots, Samantha looked at the big wooden grandfather clock in the back hall. She had to get ready for, for school soon, and she had to wake her mum. Before dragging the stepladder back into the kitchen, she peeked her head into the office. The only potential hiding place here was her dad's empty desk. She hurried in and opened all the drawers and looked in the cubby hole where she'd once hung out by her dad's knees when she was really small. Nothing. There was nothing to see in the entire room, just the desk and the empty shelves. The only other thing Samantha saw as she rushed from the room was a funny little piece of carpet stuck under the front edge of one of the shelves. Risking a search of the kitchen before waking her mum, Samantha opened one cabinet and drawer after another, feeling behind dishes, pots and pans, plastic containers, baskets and utensils. Greg remained hidden. Samantha felt Susie's presence as soon as she got into the minivan after school that day. How did Susie do it? Samantha was sure Susie hadn't been around that morning, and she knew Susie was never in school. Samantha ignored her sister's insistent pr presence that's really hard to say. Samantha ignored her sister's insistent presence <laughs> and stared at the back of her mum's messy hair. Did her mum know Susie was there? Samantha wondered if she should ask. Maybe not while her mum was driving. When her mum pulled into the driveway, Samantha turned to stare at Oliver, almost as if someone was making her do it. Usually, she ignored Oliver. Was Susie making a look? How? Oliver only had a few leaves left. Maybe she'd come out and count them before dinner. No. She had to keep looking for Greg. Beans and Franks for dinner? Her mum asked. Something that felt like a wave flowed through Samantha. The wave was dark and kind of oily. It wanted to cling to Samantha the way sadness had clung to her since Susie was gone. She thought the wave was emotion. But was it hers or Susie's? Susie loved Beans and Franks. Was she sad that she couldn't have any? Did they have food when, where she'd gone when she died? Beans and Franks are okay, Samantha said. <coughs> Can we have pineapple too? In her mind, she saw Susie screw up her face in disgust. Did Susie put that image there? Samantha had always liked pineapple with beans, and Susie thought that was gross. Their mum gave Samantha a half smile. Sure. <sighs> Come on, we, we must be near the end soon. Susie followed Samantha as she hurried from one room to the next in search of Greg. Samantha had been searching for Greg ever since they'd gotten home. Susie's drawings had worked. Unfortunately, Samantha wasn't having any luck. This was partly because she was looking in dumb places. For instance, Samantha had tried to find Greg in the hole of Oliver's tree trunk. Shining her light into the hole and muttering about elves, Samantha had held her breath and stuck her hand down deep down the hole in the tree. Susie was laughing the whole time. Samantha had believed her when she talked about elves. 
Now they were inside going all through the house. The sound of running water and clinking pans and silverware made it clear that mum was still in the kitchen. Obviously, Samantha was trying to search upstairs before their mum finished fixing dinner. She started with their mum's studio. I would never have hidden Greg in here, Susie told Samantha when she opened the studio door. Samantha paid no attention to Susie. This wasn't a surprise, Samantha was being stubborn. Why couldn't Susie remember where she put the doll? She knew where she put it the first time she hid it. It had been in her room, under her bed, which she knew was a very unoriginal hiding place. A couple of hours later, she moved it. But to where? Susie stood in the doorway of her mum's studio while Samantha scurried around, digging in piles of fabric stacked on pale yellow shelves in mounds of yarn heaped in huge wicker baskets under a row of windows and in canvas bins of wool sitting next to their mum's lo loom. Susie thought all of this was very brave because one of the standing house rules was that the studio was off limits. Samantha even opened the door to the storage room on the far end of the studio. When she went in to search, Susie didn't follow. Susie loved to play and be silly, but she wasn't crazy brave. The storage room held their mum's finished work, the stuff she sold to make money. They were never allowed to touch it. Once, when Susie was five, their mum had left one of her tapestries on the dining room table because someone was coming to pick it up. Curious, Susie went into the dining room, climbed up onto the chair, and looked at the tapestry. It was covered with fluffy tufts or so soft round fabric that delighted her. She had to touch them. Forgetting she'd just eaten chocolate chip cookies, Susie had put her sticky fingers all over the light peach coloured tufts. When she saw the chocolatey smudges, she tried to wipe them off, which spread them around even more. This made her cry, and it scared her enough to try and run from the room. In her hurry, she ended up knocking over a chair and falling. Trying to catch herself, she grabbed the tapestry, and she still hit her head on the table, which made her shriek. When her mother ran into the room, Susie was on the floor with the chocolate smeared tapestry in one hand, bleeding onto another part of the tapestry from a gash on her forehead. Oh! <laughs> her mum had been so angry. It had scared Susie. It scared her so much she never went anywhere near the mother's work again. Greg was not in the mother's studio, but Susie could only wait for Samantha to figure that out on her own. Once she did, Samantha moved on to their mum's bedroom. First, she paused in the hallway to listen. More sounds from the kitchen encouraged Samantha to enter. Greg's not in here, Susie said as, Samantha's, as Samantha got down to peek under her mum's bed. The dark blue bed skirt draped over Samantha's head like a scarf. Samantha popped up off the floor, tilted her head to listen for a second, and then went into her mother's closet. Samantha began sweeping aside hanging clothes, opening and closing shoe boxes. Don't you think she would have found it by now if it was in here? Susie said. Samantha didn't answer. Samantha looked up at the shelves above the hanging clothes. You would just crawl up the racks, Samantha muttered. Susie smiled. Yes, I would. Samantha turned into a circle, frowning. Spotting the bench that sat at the end of their mum's bed, Samantha dragged it into the closet. Susie felt bad just standing there watching, but Samantha was wasting her time. Samantha stood on the bench. Even on tiptoes, she had to strain to see the top shelves of her mum's closet. Finishing with the closet, she moved to their mum's dresser. Susie chewed on her thumb. She was sure Samantha was going to get yelled at for what she was doing. Samantha had to know that, too, but she wasn't letting us that stop her. Samantha searched through all of her mum's underwear, stockings, socks, and scarves. Samantha? What? <laughs> I just said, what? What? Samantha squealed, slamming shut the last dresser drawer. Dinner in five, okay. Samantha ran to her mum's nightstand and searched it, then did the same with her dad's. His was empty. Her mum's was stuffed full of books, fabric samples, and pills. Greg was not hiding among them. I told you so, Susie said as she followed Samantha from her mum's room. She knew she was being a snarky baby, but she couldn't help it. She could almost hear a ticking countdown in her head. Samantha has been snooping through my things, Patricia told Jeannie over the, th over the phone. Discovering her materials had been rifled through. Uh, oops, oh my god, what? I don't want to know what a door is. <laughs> uh, Patricia had decided to call her friend instead of yelling at her daughter. What things? From what I can tell, all my things, Patricia said. She pressed three fingers to her temple. Samantha knows better than that. Exactly, so she must have a good reason. What reason could she possibly have? I don't know, but I know she had to have one. Nothing's missing or damaged? Not that I can tell. Then let it go. But, seriously, Patricia... 
it's time to let it all go. Chica came at midnight. As usual, Susie felt pulled from Samantha's bed. As usual, she felt compelled to wander around the house and watch Chica's dark shape circle outside. As usual, she opened the back door and then closed it and went to the front. As usual, she wondered why she had to do what she had to do. Why did she have to leave her family? Susie opened the front door and the night breeze blew a couple of Oliver's leaves past Chica's feet and into the house. The night was brighter than the previous couple nights because the moon was fuller. The clouds were gone too. Stars were so thick in the sky they reminded Susie of powdered sugar her mum used to put on the chocolate crinkle cookies that she made at Christmas time. In some places, the stars blurred into an expanse of brilliant white light. Susie expected Chica to take her hand as usual. Instead, Chica lifted her hand and pushed Ch Susie aside. Then Chica walked into the house. Oh no! Oh! A nightmare woke up Samantha. Her eyes flew open and she clutched her blankets, listening to her heart pound. It was just a dream, she told herself. She felt her heart start to slow down. Then it sped up again and Samantha sat up. It wasn't just a dream. Chica, she whispered. Her dream had just told her more about the chick in Susie's drawing. The chick was Chica. Chica had been chasing Samantha in the dream. Samantha had been trying to move a shelf in her dad's office and Chica had been stalking her. Samantha gasped. Her dad's office. That's where... Samantha froze when she heard sounds. Thud. Tap. Thud. Tap. Samantha started to shake. Those were the sounds. They were the same sounds Samantha had heard so many times over the last few months. The sounds she tried to convince herself she'd imagined. She hadn't imagined them. Those were the sounds. Except they weren't exactly the same. They were closer. Much closer. Samantha had always thought the sounds she'd heard came from outside the house. Now she knew they were inside and coming closer. When Chica started up the stairs, um, Susie tried to follow. But she couldn't. It was like she was glued to the doorway, trapped there by invisible chains. Chica, stop, she yelled. Chica didn't stop. She climbed slowly, but steadily up the stairs. She was going for Samantha. Susie was sure of it. Susie struggled to free herself from whatever held her in place. She tried to and tried to move. Then she started to cry, and the only thing she could do to help her sister. And she did the only thing she could do to help her sister. Samantha, she shouted. Run! Samantha rolled out of her bed and ran to her bedroom door. Could she get to her mum's room before whatever was coming up the stairs to the top? Opening her door a crack, she looked toward the stairs. No, it was too late. A bright yellow man-sized chick with horrible sharp teeth was one step from the top, just a few feet from Samantha's door. She slammed her door and looked around her room. As the footsteps came closer, she dove under her bed. When the door started opening, Samantha went rigid and held her breath as orange metal feet crossed the wood floor. This couldn't be real, but it was. Trembling, Samantha watched her, the feet circle her bed. She couldn't hold her breath any longer, so she carefully let in a little air. The feet stopped. They turned. They began coming back around the bed. Then they paused. Samantha heard a terrifying whirring sound, and suddenly the bed spread hanging over the side of the bed shifted. A yellow face with purplish eyes and deadly teeth peered at Samantha. Samantha writhed, writhed, I think it's writhed, writhed away from the face, squirming toward the opposite side of the bed. Once out from under the bed, she looked over her shoulder, wondering if she could get past to flee her room before the chick straightened. No. <laughs> it was already standing, staring. Samantha ran to the window. She tried not to listen to the thud, tap, thud, tap as she fumbled with the window lock. Tremors, like butterfly wings, fluttered between her shoulder blades. She ignored them. The steps muffled as they closed her rug. She only had seconds, crawling through the window. Samantha gripped the, the interlocking diamonds of the trellis and swung her legs out. The sound of ripping fabric made her look back through the window. The trick was right there. It held a piece of her pale blue nightgown in its hands. Samantha whimpered and scrambled down the trellis. Keeping her gaze on the vine that clung to the trellis, she went as fast as she could. She was in her stocking feet, so the wood felt sharp against her soles, but she didn't care. She also didn't look up. She didn't want to know if she was being chased. 
When her feet encountered a rough, solid surface, she knew she'd reached the porch roof. Then she did look up. Nothing was coming down the trellis after her. Good, but not that good. If she wasn't fast enough, Chica could go back through the house and get her when she reached the porch. Chica. Samantha's mind had finally forced her to see what she hadn't wanted to see. The chick in the house was Chica. In her drawing, Susie had been trying to say that Chica didn't want Susie to have Greg. Why? Samantha didn't know. But she knew she was right. Chica was coming after her because she was looking for Greg. Samantha gritted her teeth as she leaned over the edge of the porch roof to grab one of the porch posts. Could she grip it well enough to hold to drop her legs down to the railing? She had to, for Susie. Samantha was going to get down and get back inside the house. Then she was going to find Greg. But thanks to her dream, she knew where to look. But could she get there before Chica? Oh, Susie, <laughs> Susie didn't know how much times. How much time she was caught in the doorway listening to the sounds of Chica's footstep upstairs. She heard several other thumps too, but she never heard Samantha scream. She hoped that was a good sign, but she wasn't sure. She thought she'd be in the doorway forever. Time went on and on and on. Then she saw, then she saw Chica at the top of the stairs. She was coming back down, and she didn't have Samantha. If she could have moved, Susie would have fallen to the ground in relief. Instead, all she could do was watch Chica come down the steps. Then suddenly, Samantha appeared from outside. Her face white and her eyes wide, her hair in a tangle, Samantha rushed past Susie. Samantha's head was down and her gaze was on her feet. She didn't look at Susie, she didn't even look up the stairs at Chica. Susie watched Samantha dart into the dining room and disappear toward the kitchen. Where was Samantha going? Samantha didn't know why she didn't think of it before. Maybe it was because even though she kept thinking about him, she really wanted to forget her dad. It was bad enough that Susie got taken from them. At least Susie didn't leave on purpose. She didn't want to leave. She was taken and she was murdered. That, Samantha thought, is a pretty good excuse for leaving the family. Her dad, though, didn't have to leave. He left because it was too hard. That's what he said. It's too hard. But that's why we need you, Daddy, she'd said to him. He just pressed his lips together, something she'd gotten from him, and he said he had to go. That's why Samantha was on her own now. Her dad was gone. Her mother was drugged to sleep. Her sister was dead. If Samantha was going to survive, she'd have to save herself. Even though Samantha didn't look up the stairs, she knew Chica was there. That's why she ran toward the kitchen. She didn't know how smart Chica was, but she figured it was worth trying to fool her. She wanted Chica to follow her into the kitchen and look for her there. If she judged right, it would give her enough time. When she reached the kitchen, Samantha turned on the light. Then she tore through the back entrance of the kitchen and raced down the connecting hall to her dad's office. In his office, she left the light off. She knew where she was going. She ran to the shelf with a carpet piece. She grabbed the edge of the shelf at chest height and she tugged on it. It didn't move. She bent over and tugged on the one below. No movement. The one above struck. Stretching, she reached for the one above that. Still nothing. It has to be. In her frustration, she kicked the shelf right next to the little carpet piece and the shelving unit popped free of, of the wall, opening out into the room. Susie had been right. A hidden room had been here all along. I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. Samantha didn't wait for the shelf door to open all the way. She shouldered through the opening and groped for a light switch. She found one just inside the opening. Flipping the switch, she held still and listened. She could, she could hear Chica's footsteps in the kitchen. Good. It worked. She looked around. The room was filled with all sorts of bizarre things. Dried leaves, rocks, broken glass, old toys, stacks of papers and books. Samantha didn't know if she was looking at Susie's stash of treasures or her dad's. It didn't matter. It only mattered that Greg, her curly hair thick her curly hair thick with dust, but her pol polka dot dress as bright as it was the day she disappeared, was sitting on top of one of the leaning book towers. Samantha grabbed the doll and darted back through her dad's office. When she reached the doorway, she looked to her right. Chica was coming down the hall. She was only a few feet away. Samantha fled through the living room and out through the front door. Panting, she looked out at the yard. It was empty, of course. She knew where Susie was, and she knew Ch where Chica was. Only Oliver stood in the yard. Oliver and his last pale yellow leaf. Samantha ran to him and hid behind his huge, solid trunk. 
Susie watched Samantha hide behind Oliver. Then she turned and waited for Chica to reach the entryway. What would Chica do? How could Susie keep Chica away from Samantha? It turned out she didn't have to. When Chica reached Susie, Chica paused. Chica held out a hand. Susie's hand raised and reached for Chica's, even though that was the last thing she wanted it to do. She felt the animatronic metal touch her fingertips. But I'm not ready, Susie told Chica. Chica looked down and her teeth gleamed in the moonlight. Susie's sheet shied back. Chica's fingers gripped Susie's tightly and Susie couldn't pull them away. When Chica turned, Susie felt herself being dragged from her home. She knew she had to stop resisting. She had to go along. So she stopped struggling and she began calmly walking next to Chica. Samantha watched Chica take her sister's hand and she watched her sister and Chica cross the porch, come down the steps and walk towards Oliver. Samantha tensed. What should she do? What could she do? Before she could decide, Chica and Susie disappeared. Not thinking, Samantha screamed. Wait! <sighs> this is getting interesting. Susie heard her sister scream. Chica didn't pause, but Susie did. However much Chica was willing to keep walking, something equally strong was willing her to go back. Caught in the middle, Susie once again couldn't move. Susie! Samantha's wailed her, Samantha wailed her sister's name. I have to go back, Susie said. I have to. She waited, holding her breath. Then she felt something shift in the air around her. Chica let go of her hand. Samantha stepped out from behind Oliver and stood next to him, Greg dangling from her right hand. Tears filled her eyes. She was too late. No. What was that? The leaves near Oliver's trunk spoiled up from the ground and then out away from Oliver. The night was breezy, but the wind wasn't going in circles. It was also it also was blowing toward Oliver, not away from him. Samantha looked up at his soul, surviving leaf again. And that's when Susie suddenly appeared in front of Oliver. She looked the same way she'd looked the day when she was abducted. She even wore the same clothes, her magenta and pink striped sweater, and the jeans Jeannie had studded with rhinestones. Samantha stared at her sister. Then she held out Greg. Susie opened her mouth, like she wanted to say something, but then she just took the pudgy doll and clutched it to her chest. I've, miss I've missed you so much, Samantha said. Susie nodded. She reached out and Samantha didn't even hesitate. She stepped into the offered hug. Susie felt as solid as she, did as she had when she was alive, maybe even more so. Samantha was never a hugger. She usually only half hugged Susie when Susie insisted on a hug. Now she hugged Susie with all of her strength. I love you, she whispered. She felt a wave of emotion flow over her, like the one she felt in the car. But this one wasn't dark and oily. This one was light, and it was warm and fizzy. Samantha was pretty sure this wave was a wave of love. Susie let go, and Samantha brushed at the tears that ran down her cheeks. Susie smiled, and then turned to Chica. Samantha watched Chica take her sister's hand. Then she watched Chica lead Susie and Greg away. They disappeared just as Oliver dropped his last leaf. Goodbye, Samantha whispered. Samantha, Samantha felt the letting go, and she felt the promise of something new. Susie was leaving, yes, but this wasn't an end. Samantha knew it was a beginning. Just like the happy ghost in the story, Susie was going where she could be with her family forever. Oh my god. That's the end. That is the end of that story. It is kind of sad. It's kind of, is it a happy ending or a bad ending? I don't really know. I feel like it's a happy ending. I feel like Samantha's just letting go. I don't know what to say. I, if there were like a few more things that were added on to this and like, I don't know, maybe a few more lines that really hit home, like I probably would have let out a few tears. I was on the verge of like letting out a single drop, uh, but I didn't. Um, it was just like when Samantha says I've missed you so, like Samantha changed from the start to the end, you know? But I'm... As well, like, it's... 
Although I'm really... It's a sad story. It's also so confusing. <laughs> like... Was Susie ever real in this story? I, I, like... I don't know. It's really confusing. Um, but I'm, I believe Susie was a ghost most of the way through it. The first time Chica came to the house, I think she was actually real and that's how she was murdered. Um, I don't know what it's got to do with the games. Because we know Susie was lured uh, with like her dead dog. And we all thought when, when we read that there was going to be an incident in this story, we all thought it was going to be something to do with a dog. There's no dogs in this story. I think that was a neighbour dog actually, but um, there's no there's no dog in this family. Um, but there is a Greg or a Grecken. I'm gonna yeah, it's called it's Grecken, isn't it? Um, but it's very strange. Is is Greg like a like a parallel to to the dog? I don't know. I really don't know. Tell me guys what you think below. Um, I kind of almost cried at the end there. But uh, I, I held back the tears. Um, I wish it was sadder. I think it would have been a lot better if it was sadder. It would have impacted me more. But um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it for me. I uh, don't know what else to think about this. Tell me guys what you think in the comments below. Uh, did you enjoy this story? I know I it wasn't my best story. But it was kind of good. Um, definitely not the worst either. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Um, and I will see you later. Goodbye.